Good evening and welcome to the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum's Exploring Space Lecture Series for 2021. I'm Ross Irwin, geologist and chair of the museum's Center for Earth and Planetary Studies, where we do original research on the planets and moons of the solar system. This year's Exploring Space lectures highlight the robotic missions that visit and sample other worlds, the planets Mars and Venus, Saturn's largest moon Titan, and the asteroid Bennu. Tonight, our distinguished speaker is Dr. Zibby Turtle, a planetary scientist at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory in Maryland. She's the principal investigator on NASA's Dragonfly mission to Titan. Dragonfly is a rotorcraft lander that will fly from place to place in the thick atmosphere and low gravity of Titan. The surface temperature there is 180 degrees Celsius below zero, or minus 291 Fahrenheit. In these extremely cold temperatures, you might be surprised to see a landscape full of rivers and lakes. These are made of liquid hydrocarbons, because on the cold surface of Titan, methane is liquid and water is solid rock. Dr. Turtle has a Bachelor of Science in Physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a PhD in Planetary Sciences from the University of Arizona. Along with her role on Dragonfly, she is Principal Investigator of the Europa Imaging System on the Europa Clipper mission to Jupiter and a co-investigator on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera that is studying our own moon. Previously, she was an associate on the Galileo Imaging Team to Jupiter and the Cassini Imaging Science Subsystem and Radar Teams to Saturn. She is a key voice in NASA's plans for future exploration of the outer solar system. She has won awards for her work on several NASA missions and for her scientific papers that have changed how we see these distant worlds. After Dr. Turtle speaks, we'll have time for questions and answers, so please feel free to submit your questions in the chat. Afterward, you can visit the National Air and Space Museum's website for more information on the final Exploring Space Lecture for this season. I am very grateful to our sponsors, Aerojet Rocket 9 and United Launch Alliance, for their continued support of this series. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight to learn about Dragonfly, in situ exploration of Saturn's moon Titan, an organic ocean world. Thank you very much. I'm Zibby Turtle, and as the principal investigator of Dragonfly, I'm very happy to be here to talk to you about our mission and uh, our exploration of Titan. Uh, I'd like to start by showing a uh, part of the team. Um, of course, uh, with any, as with any mission, there's a large group of people working on this. There are actually hundreds of people working on the Dragonfly mission right now. And uh, this is a, a group of us from our team meeting last fall, uh, held virtually, uh, as so many things are these days. So uh, why do we want to explore Titan? We don't know how life came to form on Earth. And we can't go back to study our own prebiotic history. Everything here is pretty much overprinted by biology. So we look to places elsewhere in our solar system that can provide information about the processes uh, that may have led to life here on Earth. And Titan, in many ways, is most like the early Earth. And so it holds keys to understanding our chemical origins. Titan is the largest of Saturn's 62 moons. Uh, and it stands out here not only because it's the largest moon in the Saturnian system, but also because it has an atmosphere. And so compared to its siblings in the Saturnian system here, you can't see the surface of Titan. At visible wavelengths, the atmosphere, the haze in the atmosphere actually obscures the surface. And this atmosphere is not only unique among the Saturnian satellites or satellites in general, uh, but as the next slide shows, it's also unique among um, other bodies in our solar system. So here are a number of bodies, including uh, the, some of the planets, Venus, Earth, and Mars, as well as Mercury to scale. Titan is actually between Mercury and Mars in size, but its atmosphere is actually denser than Earth's atmosphere. It's actually about four times denser than Earth's atmosphere. The surface pressure at Titan is about one and a half times that on Earth. So, uh, so it's actually pretty, uh, pretty unusual for, for uh, among the planets as well. Uh, as the next slide shows, there's some of the statistics about Titan. It's actually the second largest moon in the solar system, uh, just behind Jupiter's Ganymede. And the surface gravity is about one seventh that here on Earth. The surface temperature out at Saturn is quite cold, uh, 94 Kelvin or uh, almost, almost 300 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And at this temperature, the bedrock composition is water ice and the atmospheric composition is primarily nitrogen, but then a few percent methane. And that's, that's where things get interesting. 
As I mentioned, the atmospheric pressure at the surface is actually about 50% higher than the pressure here at the surface of Earth. And then as the next slide shows, deep beneath the icy crust, there's actually a liquid water ocean in the interior of Titan. But the atmosphere is where things get particularly interesting. The methane in the upper atmosphere breaks down uh, and recombines to form very complex carbon molecules. And these molecules aggregate into aerosols which fall out of the atmosphere and cover the surface. And so there's this very carbon-rich material all over the surface of Titan. But Titan is an icy satellite, and so that means that there's potential in the past for these organic compounds to have mixed with liquid water right at the surface of Titan. And that's what makes Titan such a unique destination for allowing us to study the chemical processes that may have occurred here on Earth in the distant past. So I'll step through a little bit about what we know about Titan. This is actually a Voyager 2 image of Titan. Um, as I mentioned, you can't really see the surface at visible wavelengths, so Voyager 2 got beautiful images of Titan's, uh, Titan's uh, atmosphere, uh, which of course is interesting in its own right. But it wasn't really until the 90s, uh, as the next slide shows, where we started to be able to get images of the surface of Titan. These are very low resolution images taken by the Hubble Space Telescope on the left, uh, and then later adaptive optics from Earth-based telescopes uh, on the right, uh, showing features on the surface of Titan. But at these scales, we couldn't really tell what they were. So it wasn't until the Cassini-Huygens mission arrived in the Saturnian system, uh, as shown on the next slide, that um, we started to get a, a higher, uh, a closer up view of the surface. Uh, so this is on the left, the Cassini spacecraft. It was a uh, very large spacecraft. You can actually see a desk there in the, in the lower right, for, which gives you a sense of the scale. And on the, the right side of the Cassini spacecraft, you can actually see this dome shape. Uh, and that's the heat shield for the Huygens probe. And on the, the image on the right, you see the Huygens probe within the heat shield. Uh, so Cassini studied the Saturnian system for 13 years. Uh, it made over 120 close flybys of Titan. It had a dozen instruments designed to study, of course, the entire Saturnian system. The Huygens probe that it carried with it uh, was designed specifically to descend down through Titan's atmosphere, to study Titan's atmosphere, and even uh, hopefully to make measurements of the surface, uh, which, it indeed, uh, which it indeed did. And it had six instruments dedicated to uh, making observations of Titan. So the next slide shows the map uh, that Cassini made. This is at near infrared wavelengths. Uh, and this is a, a, a map of the surface of Titan. Uh, the, the different features we see here, I'll, I'll step through a little bit, because uh, looking at it um, at, at the global scale, things aren't necessarily recognizable. But once we get down to the higher resolution views, Titan becomes a very Earth-like place. Uh, actually, if you could step back to the previous slide, uh, what you're seeing on the right is a synthetic aperture radar image. Uh, so the very bright features in this are rough at the radar scale. So that's at about 2.2 centimeters, so about an inch. Uh, things are rough, so kind of gravelly on the surface. And things that are dark are smooth. And those dark lines you see running across the, uh, the feature, the, running across through the features of that image on the right are organic sand dunes. It turns out that all of these darker areas around Titan's equator are filled with sand dunes. Uh, basically, the largest Zen gardens in the solar system uh, grace the equatorial region of, uh, of Titan. Titan also has impact craters, and so uh, the, uh, uh, one of them is shown here. But like Earth, it doesn't have very many impact craters, and that is a testament to uh, the active erosion and deposition cycle on the surface because Titan has active geology the way we do here on Earth. And of course, the reason we have so few impact craters or comparatively few impact craters on the Earth is also because they get uh, erased by active geologic processes. And so we see the same thing on Titan. Uh, the next slide uh, shows um, a potential cryovolcano on Titan. This is a, a site of cold volcanism on Titan. The volcanism, the lava would be liquid water. So lava wouldn't feel too hot to us, uh, but, uh, but the, the molten water may have flowed out of this, uh, this, um, 
crater Sotrapatera, right near near Doom Mons, uh, onto the surface. Um, cryovolcanism has been something that's been uh, uh, difficult to uh, to find uh, in the outer solar system, but there are some hints of it on uh, on Titan, which is particularly interesting. Uh, Titan also has channels. Um, and this is because on Titan, uh, in Titan's atmosphere, methane plays the role of water here on Earth. So there are uh, methane clouds and methane rain, and these uh, this carves channels in the surface of Titan. Uh, so these channels on the left here were near the site where the Huygens probe landed uh, on the surface of Titan. This is an image it took as it descended down through the atmosphere. And the next slide shows the um, high northern latitudes of Titan looking down on the North Pole and those very dark features again in this uh, synthetic aperture radar image um, are very smooth and they're actually filled with liquid. And so we have these large uh, seas and this field of uh, lakes at Titan's North Pole, uh, lakes uh, and seas made of hydrocarbons, liquid methane and ethane. The next slide shows uh, the, uh, some of the clouds uh, in Titan's atmosphere. There's a movie playing on the right and you can see uh, the clouds moving over. This is about a, taken over about a 24 hour period of time. You can see the bright methane clouds moving above Titan's surface. And the next slide shows uh, where the Huygens probe landed uh, the, um, and the view that, that uh, Huygens revealed from the surface of Titan. Of course, uh, the, the image at the right is the moon. Um, that's Earth's moon uh, with an astronaut standing on it. That gives you a sense of the scale. So the rocks we see on the surface of Titan on this gravelly plain uh, are uh, kind of water ice cobbled, about fist size. And uh, they look rounded the way uh, you get rounded cobbles in uh, stream beds on Earth. So Titan is an amazingly familiar place uh, in many ways, even though it's out in the outer solar system and the materials are very different. Uh, nonetheless, this, the processes that occur on Titan are very similar to, the, to some of the geologic processes here on Earth. So Titan has the key ingredients necessary for life, at least life as we know it. There's energy in the form of sunlight that drives the rich photochemistry in the atmosphere. There's also, on the next slide, organic material that is the result of this photochemistry. And uh, these abundant complex organics litter the surface where they've had the opportunity to mix with liquid water. This has been available at the surface in Titan's past uh, at sites of impact cratering where the crust will be melted by the energy of the impact forming large pools of liquid water that can persist for long periods of time and also at sites of, of potential cryovolcanism as well as at the present deep in the interior ocean in Titan. But Titan actually has two liquids in the system because there's also liquid methane in the methane cycle that I described. And it's possible that liquid methane could support uh, the development of an exotic biological system as well. So on Titan, not only can we study this fascinating uh, rich chemistry, but we can study it in the context of a planetary environment with Earth-like surface processes, mixing and transporting and modifying materials. So with Dragonfly, we want to take advantage of the fact that Titan offers us the opportunity to look for answers to very fundamental questions. For example, what makes a, a planet, or in this case a moon, habitable? And what are the chemical processes that led to the development of life, as well as has life developed elsewhere in our solar system? Now, we don't really expect that life as we know it certainly would be terribly happy uh, under the surface conditions of Titan uh, at 94 Kelvin. Um, but we would be remiss if we didn't look to see if there is evidence of, uh, of biological systems in the past on Titan. And Cassini showed us where to look for answers to these questions. We know that there are diverse surface materials and environments with an Earth-like variety of geologic processes molding the surface. And so the scientific challenge became how to get instruments to multiple sites to sample the materials and measure the compositions in detail on the surface of Titan. 
But the atmosphere, which is the source of this rich organic material, also gives us a way to explore Titan. Because heavier than air mobility is highly efficient at Titan. With a higher atmospheric density, you need a smaller wing or rotor area to generate lift. And with a lower gravity, the power is reduced as well. So the next slide shows a video of uh, our Dragonfly mission. Uh, it descends down uh, through the atmosphere, uh, much like Huygens did under a, a parachute. But then Dragonfly, is, as an octocopter, can spin up rotors and fly to its initial first landing site on the surface of Titan. Uh, so Dragonfly is an octocopter. It's got four pairs of rotors. It's actually an X-8 octocopter uh, in this configuration. Dragonfly takes everything with it the same way the rovers on Mars do, uh, and we communicate uh, directly from the surface of Titan to Earth, so you see the high gain antenna being deployed there, uh, and then being stowed again for flight to make it more aerodynamic, which is something we're not used to having to worry about in uh, uh, planetary exploration all the time. So uh, Dragonfly uh, as a mission consists of a few different mission elements. There's a cruise stage. Uh, this is the spacecraft that will take us from Earth to Titan. And then there's an entry vehicle that will protect Dragonfly as we go down through the Titan atmosphere. And uh, then within that, there's the, the lander itself. Of course, because we can fly, we have the capability to make measurements both on the surface as well as in flight, doing aerial imaging and even making prof doing vertical profiles of atmospheric parameters. I mentioned that we do direct to earth communication. Uh, the high gain antenna is articulated so that um, not only can we uh, stow it during flight to be more aerodynamic, uh, but we also can use that to track uh, where earth is to, to communicate with earth. But this gives us another advantage, which is that by mounting two cameras, and you can see uh, at the top of the, the circular high gain antenna, there are two boxes. Uh, those are two cameras, and we can use the articulation of the high gain antenna to point around the lander and build up panoramas of the, the terrain surrounding the, uh, surrounding the lander. Uh, like the uh, Perseverance and Curiosity rovers, uh, Dragonfly is designed to use an MMRTG power source. This charges a battery that we use to do all the high energy activities like flying and uh, making science measurements. Uh, the MMRTG is actually a fairly inefficient uh, power source and there's a lot of what's typically called waste heat, but for Dragonfly, that's a very important part of our, our uh, thermal design in that this waste heat can, allows us to keep everything warm in the interior of the lander on the cold surface of Titan. Uh, and also because we tend to think about drones as fairly uh, small vehicles, sometimes that we can fly around uh, you know, in our own backyards. Uh, I like to show um, this picture for scale. So this is me, and I know you don't really know how tall I am, but I'm uh, a pretty average height. Um, and I'm holding one of the prototype rotors. Uh, so this gives you a sense of the scale. Dragonfly is the same, um, uh, is about the same size as Perseverance or Curiosity. Uh, so that really gives you a sense of how much physically, how much easier it is to fly on Titan. We can take a vehicle the size of one of the Mars rovers and be able to fly from, from place to place to explore. So Dragonfly uh, is scheduled to launch in 2027 and arrive at Titan in the mid 2030s. We're actually gonna arrive at about the same time of year uh, or of uh, Titan's year as the Huygens probe, basically one Titan year after the descent of the Huygens probe in January of 2005. Uh, and we're going to a similar latitude. So we actually know what the atmosphere is like at this location and uh, um, time of year on Titan. Uh, and the next slide, as the next slide illustrates, we actually do direct atmospheric entry. We don't need to go into orbit around Saturn or Titan. We go straight into the atmosphere. And we have a very extended uh, sequence um, because the atmosphere uh, is, so, uh, is, is so extended um, that it's actually about a two hour uh, duration to get from the, the top of the atmosphere, the entry interface uh, down, to the, down to the surface. So for Mars, we hear about the seven minutes of terror and this very short period of time where every step in the entry sequence needs to happen uh, very rapidly. Uh, for Titan, we have much more time uh, during, the, uh, during the descent. 
This uh, shows where on Titan we're, we're landing. Uh, so the initial landing site is in the equatorial regions just south of an impact crater called Selk. And the next slide shows a zoomed in area here with our, our uh, uh, initial landing site in that uh, uh, approximate landing ellipse. And um, this is within the dunes and interdunes uh, and just south, as I mentioned, of this impact crater. So this landing site gives us access to a variety of materials, which is what we want to be able to do. We want to be able to measure the compositions of multiple materials. And the, we can uh, access in this area the sand dunes themselves, the organic sediments that make up the sand on Titan. Uh, we can also measure the composition of the uh, interdune areas, and these are large flat areas uh, that on Titan have materials with a water ice component. And then we can travel to the impact crater where we can actually make measurements of uh, materials where uh, liquid water and organics may have mixed over time. So the next slide shows a terrestrial uh, analog to the Titan dune fields. This is in the Namib Desert. These longitudinal dunes uh, in Namibia are very similar in scale to the dunes we have on Titan. So you can see the two, oh, if you stay, if you, thank you. If you stay on this slide, you can see the two different materials there. The interdunes are bright in that aerial image at the top and the dunes themselves are a darker orange. Of course on earth, this is both silicate material, but on Titan we have this, this water ice interdunes and the uh, organic dunes. The image at the bottom just shows what a great landing site and interdune is, this wide flat area, a couple of kilometers across between the dunes. And so of course, from an engineering perspective, these are perfect places to look for landing sites. And the next slide shows uh, the traverse that we'll take over a little over three years of exploration or, or uh, over 70 Titan days of science operations. We'll traverse, depending on where we land in the landing ellipse, up to 180 kilometers or so uh, across the dunes and interdunes and into the ejecta blanket of the impact crater and possibly down into the impact crater itself, uh, exploring a couple dozen unique sites along the way. And I should say, this is an icy satellite, and like most icy satellites, the topography is actually very subdued. And so there's a very exaggerated scale to the topographic profile here, where the dunes are 100 meters or so high, um, but the, the horizontal distance represented here is 200 kilometers. So, uh, so it's actually very, uh, very subdued topography. Dragonfly is designed to make multidisciplinary measurements at Titan. We, of course, want to understand the chemistry, the components available, the chemical processes that are working, and whether they're producing biologically relevant compounds. But we want to put those into the context of the Titan environment. Uh, so we want to understand the atmosphere conditions uh, of the atmosphere, whether they're meth methane reservoirs, for example, at the, the low latitudes here. Um, and then we also want to understand the, the processes that mix organic materials with past surface liquid water reservoirs uh, or the subsurface ocean. And we have the ability to search for chemical evidence of water or hydrocarbon based uh, biosignatures. We, as I said, don't know that, that life as we know it, that water-based life would be terribly happy under these conditions, but we would be remiss if we didn't, uh, didn't make measurements to, uh, to see if chemistry has taken that step uh, to biology in the past on Titan. So this slide shows uh, the, uh, the payload, the four instruments there's a, a dragnet, which is our geophysics and meteorology package, and that consists of a suite of different uh, sensors, as shown, uh, shown here in yellow. Uh, there's the DRAMS mass spectrometer, which is shown in orange, and that is fed by Draco, or the Drill for Acquisition of Complex Organics. You can see we had a bit of fun with our naming scheme. Uh, and you can see the, the two red drills, one on either side of the, the lander, uh, and the, the tubing we actually can use pneumatic transport to bring, uh, to bring surface samples into the mass spectrometer. The uh, cameras are shown in blue. We have a, a science camera suite of 
eight cameras. Uh, I mentioned the two on the high gain antenna we used to, that we used to build up panoramas. Uh, there are also downward cameras uh, and forward looking cameras. And uh, I'll talk about these a little more. And then we have a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer, spectrometer called uh, Dragons. Uh, and I'll talk about each of these a little bit more. Uh, so the next slide shows a video. This is just an animation of our sampling system, Draco. We have two rotary per per percussive drills, uh, one on either side. We use pneumatic transport, taking again advantage of Titan's uh, atmosphere to bring the samples into the mass spectrometer where we can do two different types of measurements. We can do a laser desorption measurement, uh, which allows us to, uh, to make measurements of the detailed composition of materials and get a, a uh, the, different, the different types of materials on the surface. We can do an inventory of those. And then we can also do uh, gas uh, chromatograph measurements. And this allows us to get at aspects of the structure, including, for example, the handedness of molecules, which can be a key biosignature, a key signature of biological control in the formation of, of molecules. We have, with the gamma ray, uh, a neutron spectrometer, we have the ability to classify the materials at, ev at every site. Uh, so this allows us to measure the bulk elemental surface composition. We can uh, distinguish uh, the uh, minor inorganic elements, uh, some of which can be uh, key for, uh, for uh, astrobiology. Uh, and we can even reveal the, the near surface stratigraphy. We can uh, see down through a thin veneer of organic material to see if there's water ice uh, in the shallow subsurface. With the um, DragMet instrument, we do meteorological and geophysical monitoring of Titan as a system, as the atmosphere interacts with the surface and the surface potential surface uh, subsurface interaction. So DragMet uh, monitors atmospheric conditions. Uh, so we measure temperature, pressure, methane humidity, uh, can detect hydrogen, and uh, we can measure wind speed and direction. And of course, look for variations in those from site to site, from day to day, and, uh, and make the vertical atmospheric profiles. Uh, we can also measure aspects of the, the regolith, the surface right uh, at the landing site. Uh, for example, understanding the porosity of the materials. And then we can uh, also make measurements of the, uh, the interior or the, the, um, the seismic activity. And so the next slide shows a simulation of uh, Titan seismic activity. Uh, Dragonfly is designed to characterize the level of seismic activity uh, of an, an icy ocean world, which is a, a very unique seismic environment. Uh, the next slide shows uh, just some uh, simulations of the, the images we'd be able to take. Uh, the panoramas I mentioned, we have the forward and downward looking cameras, and then a very high resolution imager uh, targets the uh, each of the sampling sites, one on e each side of Dragonfly. And you see an example on the right. We actually have uh, LED illumination, so we can use that to bring out the different aspects of the surface materials and get at the composition that way. And as the next slide shows, we can even use uh, um, illumination uh, in the uh, near ultraviolet uh, to search for the presence of organics that may fluoresce uh, under UV illumination. So that'll be a pretty cool nighttime experiment. So Dragonfly is in phase B. We're in our preliminary design phase and we're doing a lot of course of our design work and also testing of the hardware. And you're seeing on the left here, uh, a, a, a picture of some of the testing of our Draco uh, sampling system in our Titan chamber. Uh, this is our Titan environment chamber that can go down to uh, Titan temperatures and up to Titan pressures. And then on the right, we've been able to do some wind tunnel testing as well um, in, uh, in one of the, the Langley facilities. And the, the next slide shows um, some videos. This is our autopilot flight test uh, from just a few weeks ago. Uh, this is actually just here, uh, just down the road here in Maryland, uh, doing a full uh, autonomous flight test here. And the images on the right show the image stream uh, as being captured by the lander. Of course, we um, on Titan, uh, we don't have GPS, we don't have 
um, you know, the infrastructure that, that Mars has. So we'll be, Dragonfly will be navigating by itself uh, using terrain relative navigation. And so, uh, so we're testing that out uh, here in a, in a nearby field. Uh, so if you go to the, the next slide, um, the team is really hard at work. Uh, there's a lot going on, uh, and we're very pleased to be able to keep making uh, keep making progress even with everything else going on. Uh, we feel very thankful to be able to continue uh, continue progressing work on Dragonfly. And uh, although 2027 sounds like a long way away, uh, there's a lot to do between now and then, and we're all just really looking forward to uh, exploring Titan in the 2030s. Thank you. Sibby, thank you very much for that presentation. I'm uh, Ross Irwin with the Air and Space Museum, and I'd like to invite our viewers to submit their questions in the chat. Um, I have to tell you, when we first got those Cassini-Huygens observations of Titan, we had seen predictions of rivers and lakes on the surface of Titan. And then we went there and we saw pictures of rivers and lakes. And I remember thinking, wow, that, that just happened. And I really felt the same way when Dragonfly was selected. I mean, this is one of the most ambitious mission profiles I've ever seen. Um, just an absolutely stunning uh, you know, set of, of goals and technology that you're making available. We have a ton of questions from the audience, and so I'd like Thank to you. start with those. Um, you're flying through this dense atmosphere of Titan, and you, you talked about the descent. Why does the descent take longer on Titan than on Mars, and how is it different? Uh, it's because the atmosphere on Titan is very extended. So Titan has, um, right, it has the, an atmosphere that is denser than Earth's atmosphere, but it's got a lot less gravity. So the atmosphere is just, is, is very vertically extended. So Cassini, to give you a sense, Cassini's closest flybys um, were at about a thousand kilometers altitude. It took about a year of planning to get Cassini down to 900 kilometers altitude to make sure we were in a safe orientation that the spacecraft wouldn't tumble because there's so much atmospheric drag even up at a thousand kilometers that the, that the spacecraft can feel it. Uh, the Martian atmosphere by comparison uh, is much thinner than Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and so there's, it's just very quick to get down through the atmosphere. And of course, Mars has a lot more gravity than Titan does as well. These lakes and seas on Titan, made of liquid hydrocarbons, they're thought to have very subdued waves in them. How do we know that, and why is that the case? Uh, so there are a number of ways that we can uh, measure the um, or look for waves or surface roughness. So the, the VIMS instrument, the Visual and Mapping Spectrometer on Cassini, was able to make observations of the reflection of the sun, of the, basically the specular point, right? So the reflection of the sun off the surface of the liquid. And to, by looking at, you can, you can kind of imagine this, it's, it's raining here right now. And so if you, you know, if you look at, a, you know, if you look at a wet surface that's rough, like pavement, under a, you know, under a street lamp, you see a kind of broad diffuse area. Whereas if you look at a, a puddle, a very smooth puddle, you know, and, and see a street lamp reflected in that, you just see the reflection. And it's much, uh, it's much, a much sharper image effectively of the reflection. And so in those, uh, you know, those VIMS observations of the specular reflection of the sun off the, the surface, the glint was very sharp. And so that would be consistent with a, um, uh, that was lightning. Uh, uh, that would be consistent with uh, a very uh, smooth liquid surface uh, without waves. Later in the mission, the Cassini radar, uh, which also can measure the, the roughness of the surface, did see evidence of, of roughening of the surface that, that may have been waves or, uh, or some other, other phenomenon. Most of the observations of the lakes and seas were made during um, the northern uh, spring before, you know, kind of the, all the weather activity would pick up at the North Pole. And so uh, in terms of the, you know, in terms of meteorology, we would have expected uh, calmer conditions and then uh, um, perhaps, you know, expected to see waves later in the mission uh, or perhaps after the, the end of the Cassini mission. The technology that you're using for this mission, both for the aircraft itself and for the instruments. Is that technology already fully developed or are you still developing it working toward the mission launch date? One of the, um, one of the great things actually about uh, Dragonfly is that we've been able to really use a lot of existing technology. So we don't have to invent a lot 
uh, the innovation is in the application of existing technologies to exploring Titan. So, uh, for example, there has been, you know, just this huge amount of uh, technology development for drones, um, as well as for autonomous, you know, autonomous flight. And so we're able to take that, take advantage of that development that's already been done, uh, and then apply that uh, to exploring Titan. Similarly, a lot of the instrumentation uh, that we're using already exists. Uh, the uh, mass spectrometer, for example, is actually based uh, very closely on the SAM mass spectrometer that's on the surface of Mars right now. Uh, so again, we've been able to leverage technology. That doesn't mean there isn't some technology development because of course the Titan environment is, is very different from, uh, from Earth uh, or, uh, or Mars. And so we do need to do uh, a lot of testing and demonstration to make sure uh, that things are designed to work uh, effectively and safely in the, the Titan environment as well. So that's most of our, uh, our technology uh, development is related to the, the testing for the Titan environment itself. And you've been involved in research and exploration across a wide range of the solar system. Which questions related to Titan and to this mission in particular are you most excited about answering? Oh, that's a, that's a long answer. Um, I mean, it's it's fascinating to uh, to really be able to explore the, the chemistry of another world and, and a world in particular that has such complex organic chemistry. Uh, you know, it, it turns out that many of the moons in the outer solar system are ocean worlds and liquid water seems to, you know, be available uh, in, uh, at least within many of these moons. But the, you know, the, the degree of complexity of the organics on Titan are, are really unique. So that's particularly interesting. But what I'm really excited about actually is that we get to do these very detailed uh, chemistry measurements and then put them in the context of Titan as a system because Titan is a very complex system. And so the fact that we can also understand Titan's atmosphere and uh, make observations of the surface geology and even listen for Titan quakes really will give us a, a kind of complete picture of Titan as a system and give us a lot of context for interpreting the chemical uh, compositions that, we're, that we measure of the different materials. So that answer actually leads us right into the next question, which is um, to what degree are you going to be able to determine exactly what these organic compounds are? Um, are you going to be able to determine any of the individual building blocks of life, RNA? That kind of thing. So we'd be able to um, detect a wide molecules of a wide range of sizes. Uh, proteins and amino acids, of course, are uh, of particular interest uh, chemically uh, because uh, they are um, relevant to uh, you know to life as as we know it. Um, so we will be able to measure the specific compositions and and some of the get get a um, information about the structures of the you know of the molecules um, over over a wide range. But that definitely includes the uh, um, uh, that includes things like amino acids. Uh, we will um, have other ways of looking for uh, biosignatures. Right, you you want to. You, you want to have a few different uh, ways of, of getting at whether there is actually, uh, you know, biological control of production of molecules. Uh, so we have a number of ways of, of doing that, some related specifically to the, the compositional measurements, but we can also, for example, have, we have a hydrogen sensor, we'll be able to detect if they're hydrogen sources or sinks, um, and, uh, and that too can, you know, be a metabolic signature. There's been a lot of work uh, at, by NASA in, in recent years, uh, developing kind of, a, um, you know, the ladder of life, the different uh, types of measurements you want to make uh, to be able to understand uh, prebiotic chemistry, and then even, you know, if there is bio biology present to uh, understand what uh, biosignatures you'd be able to measure with different instruments. And so we've tried to uh, leverage a lot of that research to, uh, uh, to inform the types of measurements to make with Dragonfly. We have a, a couple of, of questions here. A, a lot of folks are familiar with the Mars rovers and Ingenuity. Um, can you compare the reentry vehicle that is going to be sent to Titan to maybe the size of the one that delivered Curiosity? or perseverance? I mean, are they sort of similar size things? I, 
Yeah, I think they're similar in size, uh, but I couldn't give you a, I couldn't give you the number off the top of my head because I don't know the the size of the uh, the Curiosity entry vehicle. Um, yeah, so but they are they're similar in size because the the landers themselves are are similar in size. And what have you learned from the uh, operation of Ingenuity on Mars? Yeah, so. Um, you know, there's always something, you know, from any mission, you can always learn lessons to take to the next mission. Um, and both the the in situ mobile exploration of the the rovers on Mars, as well as, you know, the specific flight uh, that Ingenuity has done on Mars uh, are very informative, right? It's a very different way of exploring a planet compared to being in orbit around a planet or being in orbit around, you know, Saturn and doing flybys of, of Titan. Uh, being in the environment uh, and really living in the environment and um, operating in the environment is is very different. For Titan, uh, where the days are 16 Earth days long, no one's going to have to be on Titan time uh, the way people go on to Mars time uh, for uh, for Mars exploration. Uh, but we've really learned a lot about uh, good practices and techniques uh, for doing in situ exploration. And we've been so excited to see Ingenuity's flights uh, and uh, and all they've been able to do on Mars. Can you tell us a little bit about the artificial intelligence that is going to be used for this spacecraft? Saturn is so far away that there's not going to be somebody sitting there with a joystick making this thing work. I mean, you, you have to tell it what you want to do, but then it has to be able to do it by itself and observe the hazards around and to be able to land on flat ground and that kind of thing. How does all that work? Right. So, uh, so we have a number of different sensors uh, that will be able to detect aspects of the surface to identify safe landing sites. So we have uh, we have radars, we have lidars, uh, and then for the navigation, we use terrain relative navigation with images that we uh, that we take along the um, along the the ground track. Uh, as we as we fly over Titan, as you say, uh, Titan's a long way away. The light time um, is uh, is well over an hour. The one way light time is well over an hour. Uh, so Dragonfly needs to be able to uh, fly by itself, uh, navigate by itself, and identify landing sites by itself. In fact, uh, Dragonfly uh, will do a pre-flight checklist, you know, the same way you do here on Earth. Uh, you know, it'll measure all the different atmospheric conditions. It'll say, you know, it'll send that data back to Earth. Um, we'll review it. We'll transmit a go, no go to, to Dragonfly. Uh, but then Dragonfly will actually do another pre-flight pre -flight check just before it takes off. Uh, and it will be the final arbiter of whether, uh, whether it takes a flight um, that day. The, um, the benefit of being able to fly, uh, among the benefits of being able to fly, I should say, is that we can actually scout out landing sites in advance. So we actually have a leapfrog exploration strategy. So we'll know what direction we want to go in, uh, and we'll we'll you know uh, command Dragonfly to fly in that direction. Um, but for any from any given landing site, as we go to our next previously scouted landing site, we'll actually fly past that landing site and scout out a new area uh, of interest and then come back to the previously scouted landing site. And that gives us uh, two benefits. One is that we can scout it out for hazards and make sure that there are uh, landing sites that are safe within the landing zone that we identify. And also from a scientific perspective, it gets us gives us an opportunity to look ahead and see what kinds of things we may be able to make measurements of uh, in different landing sites, uh, and uh, you know, and select a, an area of scientific interest uh, as well as a, an area with uh, safe landing sites. That's that's really a, a neat process because having been through the same kind of thought process with Mars on a number of occasions, I mean, we we pick these areas of Mars that are interesting. We just study the heck out of them from orbit to make sure that they're safe and temperature doesn't go up and down too much and and just a whole wide range of things. You're basically doing that in, in real time on each flight, looking right. to, to where you're going next. Yes, what happens to exactly. The what happens to the spacecraft that will deliver Dragonfly to Titan? Mm. Uh, so the uh, we separate from the crew stage, that will, um, that continues on. Uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the entry, sh the, the entry vehicle comes in uh, with us, of course, and the um, uh, and we'll 
the, the heat shield will drop off uh, and it will fall to the surface, uh, will fly away from the, will release from the back shell and fly away. Uh, and that will fall to the, the surface as well. So those, those two elements uh, will land on the surface. And you're gonna do a number of flights. How yes. much distance overall do you expect to be able to, to cover over how many flights? And are you optimistic about having an extended mission going well beyond what you originally thought? Um, right, so how far we need to traverse to get to the crater uh, and to you know, be able to explore the crater deposits depends on where we land in that landing ellipse. And the landing ellipse is a little larger than we're used to for Mars, again, because Titan's atmosphere is larger. Uh, so there's a much bigger uh, possibility of dispersion uh, in the in the Titan atmosphere, so we have this this larger landing ellipse. Uh, so depending on where we land in that in that ellipse, uh, we may need to travel uh, you know over a hundred miles uh, to from our initial landing site to get into the crater deposits. Uh, and of course, as we've learned from exploring Mars in situ. Uh, you know, there are all sorts of fascinating things you, you find along the way. And so there's always this kind of healthy tension between staying and making more measurements in this area or going to see what's, uh, uh, what's beyond the horizon. Uh, so yeah, in the three years, we expect to, uh, to explore a couple dozen sites uh, over, you know, uh, up to 100 miles or so of, uh, of ter territory. Um, and it's, uh, it's certainly exciting to think about possibly getting to uh, uh, have an extended mission. Uh, the the limiting factor um, in terms of lifetime is the uh, uh, is the heat output from the MMRTG, uh, and once the heat output drops uh, too far, uh, then Dragonfly won't be able to stay warm. Uh, but that uh, time is several years, so we can certainly uh, we can certainly think about uh, the possibility of extended missions, either staying in one place and being a you know a, a meteorology and seismic station uh, to really kind of dig into aspects of Titan's atmosphere uh, and subsurface, or continuing on and exploring new terrain. Yeah, uh, that that technology, you know, being able to to power these spacecraft, you know, that far from the sun, you can't use solar panels. You you have to rely on nuclear power sources, and and they they decay fairly quickly. They do, they do. But for Dragonfly, we uh, we would have several years uh, of power and uh, and heat from the uh, from the MMRTG, uh, so um, much longer than the the nominal missions. So hopefully, we'll be able to explore further afield. The next couple of questions we have here focus more on people than on robots. Um, do you have community outreach uh, programs planned and incorporated into your mission? Uh, absolutely. So we're working with NASA right now to develop our edu education, uh, our um, communication and engagement plan is what it's called. Uh, so we're working with NASA to develop that. Uh, we obviously, um, we're very excited about Dragonfly and, uh, and exploring Titan. And we run it, we want to bring, you know, people along with us for the, you know, for the, uh, the excitement, not only of exploring Titan, but right now, right? I mean, the you know the development uh, stage, the testing stage, you know, it's all very exciting. It's very challenging, um, but uh, but it's very exciting. And so we want to be able to share that. And so you know, the various videos, for example, that uh, that I showed are, are things we're trying to make sure we're doing releases and and keeping people up to date on all the all the things that that we're doing because we're really excited about that. Um, we also have um, uh, some. Um, uh, we have a guest investigator program uh, for uh, early career uh, and graduate students uh, to bring uh, people in uh, who aren't already, you know, connected to uh, Dragonfly or, or, you know, planetary exploration uh, to, uh, you know, to try to broaden participation in the mission. And we need to really think as a, you know, a long-term outer solar system mission, uh, we really need to think about ways to continue to bring, uh, bring new people in uh, and uh, and uh, develop and provide experience uh, for uh, early career members uh, who, 12 years from now, um, you know, will be uh, key uh, key members of the team uh, doing uh, science at Titan. Okay, yeah, uh, that last question actually answered the the, the follow-on question, which is which was about bringing uh, folks onto the team who you know may very well have senior leadership roles on the team, you know, as as you as you progress onward. Um, I, I guess the last question that we have here uh, before we have to wrap up for the night um, pertains to uh, 
the personal experience of, of being on Titan. You said it has a, a dense atmosphere. It's a cold atmosphere. So it's not just that the pressure is higher, but it's so cold that the air is denser than it, it would be uh, on, on the Earth. And you don't have a lot of wind. What would be the experience of walking on Titan if you were there yourself? Yeah, it wouldn't. It probably wouldn't be gravitationally too different from walking. You know, walking on the moon, you'd feel very light. You'd be able to jump pretty far. Um, and uh, actually, uh, with the lower gravity and the um, uh, the lower gravity uh, and the atmospheric density, if you put wings on, you'd actually be able to soar over the surface. And so, you know, so that's one of the most you know evocative things I could think of about it. You know, being able to explore another another planet is the idea of being able to fly over the surface uh, oneself. Something people you know kind of dream about here here on Earth. We'd be able to uh, we'd be able to do that. Uh, so it would be a really it would be a really fun place to be able to explore it by in person. Okay. Thank you very much again for this wonderful presentation tonight. It, it's it's an extraordinary mission. I, I can't wait to see it. Um, you know, it'll take a little while to get there. I mean, you have multiple flybys of Venus and the Earth in order to, to, to get out to Saturn. Um, but it's going to be well worth the wait. I mean, the thing is just truly extraordinary. Um, thank you so much again. A big thank you to our sponsors, uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne and United Launch Alliance for making our lecture series possible. Uh, thank you again, Zibi. Please join us for the next Exploring Space Lecture, which will take place on June 29th. Um, the uh, talk is Venus Rediscovered in Astrobiological or Astrophysical Frontier. Uh, please sign up for our reminders on our website and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And thanks again to all of you for spending your evening here learning about Titan. And thanks very much. <laughs>